Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. KJRadio.com. Glad you are here with me. I promise you, we got amazing stuff to talk about today. More craziness to report in the world of leftism, looniism, liberalism, progressivism, democratism, whatever you choose to call it. I can guarantee you, I will prove to you as I do every day, five days a week, noon to three Eastern time, Monday through Friday. You can catch the show on the weekends as well. Or if you prefer, go to KJRadio.com to hear it. But I guarantee you, I will prove to you each and every day using only liberals themselves. I will prove to you that they are nuttier than squirrel turds. And it's just the truth. I, I hate to say this about our fellow brothers and sisters. We are three and a half degrees of separation from every, knowing every one of these clowns. And we can't get sanity through to them to save our lives. And it isn't because of us, folks. It's because of the people that represent us. And I will talk about those clowns as well. The summer of resistance is what the left calls the resistance of you. The resistance of of the 62 million people plus who voted for Donald Trump, the resistance of the 62 million people who get up every day and work for a living, pay your taxes, play by the rules only to get shafted. You know, the old saying, she got the mind and I got the shaft. Well, that's what's happening to you. America is the leftist. America has divorced itself from you And she got the mine and you got the shaft. You are paying for all of their idiocy. You're paying for their kids. You're paying for their schooling. You're paying for their welfare. You're paying for everything that they want to do. Their indulgences. You're paying when they go burn down your city over nonsense. You pay for it. You're paying for racism. You're paying for the idea of diversity In the most diverse country on the planet, you're paying for that. And not only do you pay for it, they undermine that diversity by telling people we're not diverse enough. Well, where is it more diverse? Have them argue with you about the diversity that exists in any country in Africa as it compares to the United States. Have them argue that point. Have them argue the diversity of any country. In Latin America, as it pertains to the United States, have them argue the diversity of any country or where in the Middle East, where it is overwhelmingly Arab and have them to argue that as it compares to the United States. And you know what you will get? Silence. Have them argue about white privilege and the scourge of colonialism and then ask them the very simple question. How does the white population look in comparison to other populations? And see what answer you get. It's ridiculous. But we deal with this stuff every day. And despite all their efforts by these lunatic leftists to crush Donald Trump, ergo to crush you, who's getting crushed? They're getting crushed. I will regale you today with even more (laughs) stories of woe for the left that they know. They know it in their hearts. They know it in their creepy little black hearts that they are wrong. They are wrong to fight you, but they have become petulant children. Teenagers rebelling. How could you possibly be right? What they're saying, honestly, people, how could I have been wrong all these years? Well, you have been. They've been wrong for years. They don't care. And it takes Kevin Jackson of the Kevin Jackson radio show and people like me and people like you out there every single day talking about this stuff, reminding them of how stupid they sound. Have a conversation with them about the economy. Ask them what they know. Say, you know what? Let's I tell you what you hate Donald Trump. Tell me what it is that you hate about him. And well, and then say, I tell you what, give me an idea of what you think he's done pro or con against the economy. They can't answer. Well, he just, he he won't let, you know, people in and he's like, hates Mexicans and he hates black people. He's a racist. 
and and he grabs women by the naughty parts and blah, blah. they can't tell you a single they won't tell you anything of con of any consequence nothing concrete because they have nothing concrete what are you going to argue about Donald Trump's lowered unemployment rate to well below what Barack Obama did. Barack Obama's, I mean, a Trump stock market is ahead of Barack Obama's by far. Trump has lowered the cost of doing business in America and revitalized the economy to the point where people can actually go look for jobs and find them. And then you can name all the jobs. You, it isn't like it's a guess. Let me tell you something. I could name you 10 companies that Donald Trump has impacted. Since becoming president, and I promise you, there are 20 more large corporations who are doing even more that you don't even know about. And so, and, and if I name you to 10, if I start out with Carrier, because I love that as an example, because Barack Obama said he couldn't save it. Then we go to Ford not moving a plant, GM deciding to build here. We go to IBM bringing jobs back, U.S. Steel saying we're bringing steel manufacturing back to the United States and opening up 200 new jobs right across the river in New Orleans in southern Illinois at their Madison steel plant. What about Dow Chemical, who says we're going to build an innovation facility in Detroit, Michigan and bring more money into the economy. Bring, we're going to invest more. Apple, we're bringing manufacturing back to the United States. How many companies do I need to list? I could go on. SoftBank's going to bring 50,000 new jobs and already did, brought 5,000 of them and invest 50 million into the economy, 50 billion rather, into the economy. Alibaba says we'll create a million jobs. They can do it. I've explained it. I could go on. Company after company, bringing manufacturing back, bringing innovation back, and on and on. And you know what we have? We have nothing but leftists who want to fight the guy who's creating opportunity. Who do you think's going to get these young black men off the street, unemployed to practically 50%? Who's going to put them to work so they can take care of their kids and their families? Huh? Barack Obama? Hillary Clinton? Who? Eric Holder? Oh, no, it's the next series of Democrats that's going to do it, right? Because they're so progressive in their thoughts. Folks, let me tell you, I'm going to... I'm going to give you stories today, that, and we're going to hopefully cover from angles that you haven't heard before. But this stuff, it, it, it'll blow your mind what these people think about you, what they think about Donald Trump, and how much they hate you for being right. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. Kevin J. 
Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson. It's the Kevin Jackson Show. I got to tell you, my heart goes out to the folks in Florida because it's just Irma is just pounding that place. And, you know, more loss of life. We've got dozens of people who've died in this storm who should have evacuated. Let's just be honest about it. They should have evacuated. I heard a story. One guy, he's like, man, I will never ride out another hurricane again. Half his roof caved in. He and his family were hunkered down trying to ride it out. It says, you know, rainy, cold, not not cold, but rainy and, uh, you know, the flood waters. And he just said it was a harrowing experience. I can't imagine. And I get it. Look, folks, we believe our homes to be safe, but I know how homes are built. They're they're barely on a foundation with wood, right? It's a foundation and it's got wood and You know, I mean, it can be just shifted off. It's not we're not talking about the most sturdy of dwellings. Yeah, it'll withstand quite a bit, but 180 mile an hour winds. I mean, it just rips the roof right off of things. Talking to a friend of mine, he just uh, they they own a hotel chain and they had just bought a hotel, a Best Western in uh, Orlando, I believe. And he says, you know, these these buildings, he says that one of the things he's fighting, he says, uh, half the roof blew off. He goes, now we hadn't put the roof on. We had just acquired the property, but the roof blew off half of it. So he's like, it's going to be a gut, you know? So, but it's a, it's on a, a Disney property and you know, it, they'll build it back. And these guys build amazing hotels. So, you know, I'm looking forward to it. In fact, when I get down there, I'll probably stay at it. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, my heart goes out to him because we broadcast at WGUL and WLSS, uh, one station in Tampa, the other in Sarasota. Obviously, Tampa is being hit a little harder than Sarasota, but our hearts go out to you guys. You know how much I love you because you were one of you were my flagship station for a long time, and uh, you know love the management team down there and everything. So hopefully everything works out, and I can even actually get down there and spend some time with you. Anyway, I'm regaling you with leftism today, and I do this every day. I don't. I feel like it's nothing new. It's tough for me to get up and get motivated <laughs> with with the stories that come out because it's the same thing. It's nuttiness just moving around a bit. You know, it moves from one location to the next, one gender to the next, one you know whatever sexuality, if you will. So whether we're talking about black folks, black crazy leftists, white crazy bourgeois leftists. LGBT leftists, Latino leftists, where it's all leftism, run amok, gone crazy. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it. What do you start? Uh, let me give you some ideas. So we got the ESPN anchor. Who's called the president, a white nationalist. We've got what I call uh, affirmative action in fashion. Involving Michelle Obama. We've got Katy Perry, who's apparently sinking pretty low. We've got a black chick who pushed down an 80 year old man on a bus. I'm just giving you some ideas. I know where it's the worst city to live in America. Do you, we've got a group of Democrats that now want to give Medicaid to everybody. We've got Hillary Clinton's book. What happened (laughs) and the results, how good is the book doing? Blah, blah, blah. So we got a lot to talk about. And on top of that, we have a professor who's talking about pedophilia We've got the heels of 9-11 and a host of other things. And I don't even know where to start because there's so much going on. I guess I'll start with the tweet of the day, which came from Black Hannity. (laughs) That's what the guy calls himself. And it was about Sarah Sanders responding to a question about if President Trump read Hillary's book. And he and uh, he he quoted her as saying, I think he already knows what happened. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was a tweet of the day, but we also got um, Sarah Sanders saying this, and here's the, the clip of that. Like, Sarah, will the president be reading Hillary Clinton's book, and what does he think about the excerpts <laughs> that have gotten out so far? Uh, whether or not he's going to read Hillary Clinton's book, I am not sure, but I would 
think that uh, he's pretty well versed on what happened, and I think it's pretty clear to all of America. Um, I think it's sad that after Hillary Clinton ran one of the most negative campaigns in history and lost, and the last chapter of her public life is going to be now defined by propping up book sales with false and reckless attacks, uh, and I think that that's a sad way for her to continue this work. So we'll get into book sales in just a bit, but what a response. I mean, great response. First of all, why would President Trump read The Drivel of Hillary Clinton? She needs to be reading his books, right? I mean, come on, let's get an amen. Yeah, there you go. Shake your heads, boys. <laughs> yeah, she needs to be reading his books. The Art of the Deal and you know negotiations and branding and things like that. Hillary's got a tainted brand. Come on. If you're a branding person and you look at Hillary, you're like, "Ooh, we got a lot of work, girlfriend. A lot of work. So she's tainted. And Sarah Sanders is right. Hillary Clinton's claim to fame is going to be all the excuses that have been given for her to lose, except for Hillary to say, you know what? I just screwed up. I underestimated Donald Trump. I overestimated my team. I overestimated the pull of the Clinton name. I overestimated that Barack Obama would be able to help, that his policies would really be able to help me. And be honest with you, we didn't really have a message. My message was don't vote for Trump. I didn't have a message. You know, I was embroiled in controversy. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I that I'm part of the controversy, but they had me embroiled in controversy and you know, for whatever you, you can look at Benghazi, you could look at all the other things while I was secretary of state, some of which I own up to, you know, I could have had a better response and not gotten people killed. I could have, you know, but she, no, let me, when is a politician falling on the sword like that? It, it doesn't happen. The, the closest we get is when we're dealing with Donald Trump and he says something to the effect of, yeah, so I, I went bankrupt. Yeah, but look at the number of businesses that I, I helped build that are not bankrupt. So I've got 100 successful businesses and four that weren't. It's not bad, not a bad track record. You know, that's as close as you get. And that's why Trump, quite frankly, resonates with people because he, I could have, I would have had a better response than that. And I said this when Trump made that response that he, because he, he threw his uh, investors under the bus. But it worked out for him because people were like, you know what? It wasn't the typical political answer. It, it isn't so much that he gave the best answer. It wasn't political. And people were craving for somebody to not give me the political answer. Hillary Clinton gives you political answers. All these guys do. They don't want to answer questions. You can ask a question, answer it, direct, answer it direct, directly saying, now look, I, I get that this is a set up question, but I'm going to answer it directly and give you a qualifier. That way you're now able to just say, you know, so Kevin, do you think that, you know, going against Russia is this blah, blah, blah. Yes or no. Okay. Well, let me just give you the yes or no answer. The best interest of America is always what we do. So of course, going against Russia is what we should do. But you have to remember folks, it's a global world and we can't just rule somebody out because we disagree with their politics or their government or their philosophy. Putin may be a bad guy. But we got to get to the table with him to see if we can at least get our interests met. And that's a good answer. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. We got a ton to talk about. I really want to get into this ESPN story. I want to get into Donald Trump, what he said back in 9-11 when it happened, and Kennedy sounding a lot like Trump in terms of his policy, his tax policy. So we got a lot of that to talk about. But before we get into that, I want to continue a little bit with this Hillary Clinton thing. And the reason why is Hillary Clinton, I want you to think what would have happened had things just been a little bit differently, how would Hillary be remembered? How quickly have the left turned on Hillary? There, there are people that worked in her campaign that are going STFU. If you know what that means, it means shut the flunk up and go away. And I'm telling you, they're using that language with Hillary Clinton. She's 
on the next book tour, the previous book was Stronger Together, which was a flop. Now she's got what happened out there and it's being lampooned. I mean, it's being ridiculed. It's more Hillary Clinton, more excuses. And the Democrats are verklept. They're going, look, we do not want to be known as the party of excuses, but that's what they're being known for because Hillary will not let this go. She can't let it die because Hillary is hurt. She's butt hurt. She needs some Obama butt bomb because she can't understand why she lost. And, and it's impossible to, rec- to uh, reconcile that inside of herself that the guy that she despises so much be- only because he ran for president against her be- and beat her now runs the country. She feels the same way about Barack Obama, but she can't say that because she can't let go of him. That's the only little uh, lifeline left to her legacy. And that's being cut by Donald Trump. The Democrats are in a rock and a hard place. They can't, they want to get, they want to distance themselves from Barack Obama. They really do. The Bernie faction is still there, but they have no home. They're on an island. Hillary Clinton, they wish would go away. They want the Clinton legacy gone. It won't happen. They have no message. So they're finally resorting to stop criticizing the president because better, better, better didn't work. Papa John's may be sued to get that back, but it isn't working. So what they have, they finally have resorted back. I'm talking about at the, at the leadership level to saying, let's follow Trump for a while. And let me tell you why that is. Because they need to glom on to a win. The Democrats haven't won anything in a long time. Don't misunderstand me. They won in 2012. They got Barack Obama. Sometimes, you know, the old saying, it's, if you're a dog, you don't want to necessarily catch the car. You may run along barking at it, but go ahead and bite that wheel, you know, or bite, bite the rag that's hanging out the, the door and watch what happens. And that's what they did. They caught the car. And <laughs> because they shouldn't have caught the car. They don't have any wins. 2008 was a huge victory for leftism. Or it was supposed to be. But what happened? Barack Obama had to perform and he underperformed. But what did they do? They glossed over it and they gave him another shot. Oh, he just needs more time. And they gave it to him. And then by 2016, he was a nobody. If you don't believe me, just go look you yourself. Just just compare first before you go do any research. Ask yourself the Barack Obama 2008, which some of you voted for whom some of you voted for versus the Barack Obama of 2016. If you took the 2016 Barack Obama, reversed him back to 2008, could he beat Trump? Nope. He might not even beat McCain. So Barack Obama's star went from the highest you could possibly be in politics down to nothing. Essentially nothing. Now they'll fake and say they love him. Oh, we love him. We love him. We love him. And, and I'm going to talk about something that happened recently to where they'll, oh man, we love the Obamas, but they don't. They don't love him. And he couldn't pull Hillary's big, you know, white buttocks over the finish line, as I like to say, because he has no more juice. He came back. He threatened Donald Trump. If he passed Doc, then I, then me and him going to have to go round and round. Well, what? Really? So Barack, uh, Donald Trump said, boom, I'm Doc is gone. Oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Barack Obama? I just got rid of your unconstitutional law. What are you going to do? And I gave it back to Congress. How can Congress complain? Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are Congress people. Why do you think they want to work with Trump? Trump's going, look, do your doggone jobs. I don't need to be. The, we don't need executive orders because it's your job to do. Barack Obama illegally did it. I undid it. Now go do your dog, doggone jobs. And Paul Ryan, that goes for you and McConnell. So anyway, I, it got the whole thing. The reason I'm having this conversation is I want to talk about Hillary Clinton and her new book because she won't go away. They want they want her to go away, but she won't. So Ed Morrissey, who's a, a part of the hot air team, a very staunch conservative, good guy. He says, went to Barnes and Noble last night at the Mall of America and it didn't have a single copy of what happened. No display, no books, 
Nada. Nothing. Now, if you watch the, the, the videos of Hillary, there's a, I think it's in New York, they have a wall of her book, What Happened, dedicated, okay? And they have a couple of guys standing guard. <laughs> you got to see this picture. It's hysterical. They're, I mean, they may not be standing guard, but they're like, you know, we're waiting for the rush. And then they, they, they report it. There were hundreds of people outside waiting to get in to get Hillary's book. So let me tell you what they did as, a, as an author. They took, because this is what they tell, they'll say to me, Kevin, um, so we're going to carry your books. Where are you going to be? You know, like, what's your schedule? Okay, I'll be in New York. I'll be in uh, uh, D.C. And I'll be in Phoenix. So they move your books to where you are going to be. Or where are you going to be doing radio? Where are you doing live remotes? They look at your schedule. When you're not, now uh, keep in mind, Hillary Clinton's people, they've invested millions on her. So they're moving her around from place to place. But the only place she gets traction is in places like New York, maybe Chicago. Everywhere else, they don't even care about that book. That's why Ed Morrissey's going, I was in Minnesota, Mall of the Americas, nothing. I dare Hillary Clinton to go to Minnesota and go to the, any mall there and do a book signing. They'd have to rustle up. She better have some books with her. You know what I'm saying? So they, the way the book guys do now, because they got to keep the number, you know, the, the dollars down. Unless you're doing Harry Potter or something, Hillary's are contrived numbers. So the LA Times wrote, Hillary Clinton, who spent decades on the public stage in a myriad of roles and changing personas, emerged in one and a new one. Ghost from the political past, the, this, the reception was decidedly mixed. On the day marking publication of her third memoir, the former first lady, U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, two-time Democratic White House hopeful and loser of the searing 2016 presidential election made a flurry of campaign stops, including a book signing and media interviews. Chance to reopen old political wounds, reemergence of their heroine offered a chance to ponder what might have been. In New York, hundreds lined up at Barnes & Noble in Manhattan for a chance to shake her hand, enjoy a snatch of conversation, buy their own autographed copy of what happened. So, do you see the? if you look at the graphic, the picture they took of the hundreds lined up, I'm not lying, folks. Look at it for yourselves. You can tell that the photographer zooms in on an angle that makes it look like the, the people are coming out the door for this thing. What they did was they stopped people at the door. They lined them up and they took a picture. And I, I would tell you there's maybe 15 to 20 people in the picture. Now, if there were hundreds lined up, I promise you, they would have gone further back. They would have shot that line, you know, so you could see it was bunched up. They even had like in, in spots on the picture, you could get seven people in between some of the other folks. So in other words, it wasn't even a packed line where they were bunched up next to each other. It, there were 20 people and, and they, in order to get them all in, they went as far back as they could. And these people were spread out, but they, there's hundreds waiting. And then you go inside and they got the books lined up. I'd love to see the real deal on that book. Uh, you know, on how many people were there, how many books got sold, etc. So what they're saying is that they try to make it sound like, oh, it's really doing great. It's an Amazon bestseller. Well, let me tell you about Amazon bestsellers. I'm one. You can become an Amazon bestseller if you sell a crap load of books in one day. You can if I, let's say the average book is selling 50 per day and it's a number 13 or whatever. So a good book may be selling, uh, you know, 78 to 120 a day, whatever. If you come in and over, you know, you sell 400 books day one, 230 books day two, you're already an Amazon bestseller. Now you don't have to maintain it for 30 days. You reach that status and you can say, I'm an Amazon bestseller. That's all it takes. Hillary Clinton if her book was doing that well, they would be telling you it is a New York Times bestseller. And it would be immediate. She's not even New York Times out of the block. That's pretty scary. If I were Hillary Clinton, I'd be pretty scared about that. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? 
The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177 or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. KJRadio.com if you want to call the show. 844-551-8255. And uh, I was, uh, one of my buddies, he sent me a note. He says, hey, Kevin, I got the perfect way to get rid of Kim Jong-un. And I was like, what that, what's that? He says, start a rumor that he's got dirt on Hillary Clinton. And then a meme got created about it, which I think is hysterical. But it's probably very true. And speaking of Clinton, because we've been talking about her and her book uh, so far today, but apparently her lawyers are finally being probed for destroying evidence. And let's hope it's an alien autopsy, if you know what I mean. They're getting probed. What do you get when you cross a bad politician with a crooked lawyer? Chelsea Clinton. (laughs) And boy, is Hillary Clinton a crooked lawyer. But then, so again is Bill. But he's the only real politician. Hillary just rides his coattails. But see, Hillary's not the only crooked person hanging around the Clinton camp. And I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, in this latest probe we're going to find out. Because some of Clinton's satellites, that's what they call them, were not under, uh, they weren't given immunity by the crooked James Comey, former FBI director, who, by the way, I hope goes to prison. I told you guys the other day, I want heads on my wall. Uh, Think of it as a hunting lodge. And I want to see Democrat heads uh, from a taxidermy stuffed. Not literally. You know, I mean, not, you know, I don't want to see these people die, but I want to see their heads on the wall. You know what I mean? I want them in prison. And maybe we're going to get closer to this because her attorneys could face disbarment and so could Hillary Clinton. Because in Maryland, a circuit court judge ordered the state bar to open an investigation into that law firm that represented Hillary Clinton. So three lawyers who allegedly deleted thousands of Clinton's emails are going to be scrutinized. And according to the Maryland Attorney General initiating the investigation, this isn't just a right wing frivolous claim. There is merit to this claim. There are allegations of destroying evidence, Judge Harris said at a hearing. He said that investigations must be conducted if the allegations have merit. So lawyer Ty Clevenger, who has doggedly pursued sanctions against Clinton and her legal team, brought the case against the Clinton lawyers, and he's seeking to have Clinton and her attorneys suspended or disbarred. He contends that the lawyers helped Hillary Clinton destroy emails from a secret server. The 2016 Democratic uh, presidential candidate or nominee at the time kept in her New York home. And while Hillary turned over thousands of these emails, she destroyed 33,000 saying they were private, unrelated to her work as Barack Obama's secretary of state. And we all know the litany of lies that she told thereafter. Hillary Clinton said they were all about yoga and Chelsea's wedding and, you know, things that were innocuous. And we found out later by pulling teeth that uh, that nothing, none of that was true. And we knew it. I mean, come on. You knew inherently that Hillary Clinton was lying. You had to. So my thesis is this is what um, Clevenger says. He says, if you're a politically prominent attorney, you are held to a different standard. 
I've seen this in Texas and California. I chose this case because I knew people would pay attention. Now, I want to, you're an attorney for a client and they say, I'm going to destroy potential evidence. And you go, don't worry about it. I got it. We'll do it. So the bar council tried to blow off the lawsuit. And it doesn't surprise me because anytime the Clintons are to be held responsible or accountable for their actions, that they stonewall or somebody has to die. In this case, they chose the former and attempted to stonewall. And the attorney general called the lawsuit frivolous and asked for a dismissal. Why not? Hillary Clinton, could you get a dismissal? So, uh, According to court documents, the bar council responded accordingly. Clevenger holds, quote, no personal knowledge of the allegations presented in your correspondence, nor are you a personally aggrieved client or party possession material information that would assist this office in reviewing such allegations. I think they meant party possessing material information that assists this office in reviewing such allegations. So what they're saying is you haven't been hurt nor are you a party who has information that can show that other people have been hurt. So the bar council dismissed Clevenger's complaint, prompting him to ask the judge to force the bar council to investigate the allegations. Now leftists assume this would be another moment of sweeping Hillary sins under the rug, but the judge didn't agree. The attorney, the attorney general I mean, he he wanted a motion to dismiss and the judge was like, not going to happen. So the judge is a guy named Ronald Silkworth. He ruled Clevenger has every right to request an an investigation rather as a Maryland law allows any person to file a bar grievance. That's the catch. (laughs) And I got to tell you, legal stuff is fascinating to me. I almost went to school to get a law degree. Because I said, even though I went to school and got my double E, electrical engineering degree in computer science and math, I said, you know what? You can never, it will never hurt you to understand the law. Now, I'm glad I didn't because I'm too curious. And I would be, you know, the black Perry Mason. I just would take it too seriously because I have a tendency to go overboard. That's why I never use drugs because I'd be a biggest crackhead you ever met. I'd be like, hey, y'all, you got some crack. Cause I'm going to love it. You know what I mean? I would love the, I love the law. I love the intricacies of it. And I love it when I'm, I'm not saying it's just that it goes our way. I think it's cool that somebody can find a press. I don't like precedence as much sometimes because a precedent doesn't mean you have to do it. It's like, well, there's a precedent of keeping slaves. It's called Dred Scott. Well, yeah, but that, that doesn't mean it's good. And the Supreme court, of course, overrule that. But all I'm getting at is, I love looking at the nuance of how things work because law is legitimate debate over two very different issues and it gets resolved. See, we're having a debate over conservatism versus liberalism. And is it being resolved? No, we don't have the good enough attorneys, people prosecuting on the idea of conservatism. So we get beat. The defense goes, yeah, but y'all are racist. And we go, because our attorneys don't know how to respond. You're a misogynist. You're an Islamophobe. You're anti-gay, homophobic. We just cry every time. We don't go, well, I beg to differ and give an argument back. So that's why I like this. And I like going through this type of stuff. And this judge gets it. He ignored the arguments for dismissal. Here's what he says. I just think this is a rather easy decision. At this point, the court is ordering bar counsel to investigate. You have a citizen who's telling you, look, I don't like the way this went. How can a a law firm destroy evidence in a criminal investigation and nobody says anything that those attorneys and Hillary Clinton, if she instructed them to do that as an attorney, she should lose her license. If they did it as attorneys, they should lose their license. I don't know about you. I'm too con- I'm concerned that nobody would be held accountable if we let politics get in the way. When we bring in the legal system, maybe we'll get some justice here. 
I don't want the Senate and those guys doing this or Congress. I want a judge to go, you're exactly right. (laughs) There's a criminal investigation going on. You've got information that you should have turned over, quite frankly, to the defense, I mean, to the prosecution, and you didn't. And instead of doing that, you destroyed evidence. You attempted a fraud. Even when Clinton admits to mishandling her email, she still finger points. But she said, you remember this? The most important of the mistakes I made was using my personal email. That was ahead of her book launch. I said it before and I'll say it again. This was my responsibility. It was presented in such a negative way and I never could have gotten out from under it. It never stopped. Blaming others. Woe is me. And why wouldn't you believe Hillary Clinton? I mean, she's very forthcoming. Remember, uh, it only took a lawsuit to get the information that we currently have about her. Judicial Watch had to get, they requested and got 448 pages of documents from the State Department that revealed incidents involving Huma Abedin, Hillary Clinton, multiple people on her staff with classified uh, emails that were being sent back and forth willy-nilly and all kinds of stuff. And Hillary Clinton still claims she did nothing wrong, even though there doesn't have to be intent. And then we find out later that in the destroyed emails, there were some things that could have led to intent, and she dismisses it. He won't stop until he's the top-rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up, everybody? Kevin Jackson here at the Kevin Jackson Show, where we talk about liberal lunacy. And I promise you, we've already had in the broadcast, early in the broadcast, an hour of leftist lunacy that compares to nothing in the world. I mean, it's it's like Mount Vesuvius erupting with mudslides and 14 Irmas blowing all all over the world at the same time. There's nothing compares to the storm of liberalism around the world, leftism at its finest. You don't believe me, do you? You're like, Kevin Jackson, you prove it. Well, first of all, let me give you some housekeeping. KJRadio.com is where you can get more about the show. And if you dare, call the show 844-551-8255. 844-551-8255. And I want to hear from you. Good, bad, or ugly. We want to hear from you. We read your stuff. If you send me a note, I'll read it from time to time. Sometimes I just cover your discussions. Before I get into the liberal lunacy that I wanted to talk about, there's a lady that sent me a note. She called, actually, and she says to me, Kevin, why do you want that girl who who was a, said she had her first abortion in Seattle? Why do you want her to have babies? And I go, I don't want, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want her to have babies. What are you talking about? She's saying because I'm pro-life that I'm wanting this chick to have babies. That's not what that meant. And by the way, the lady says she's 88 years old. She's raised two sons. She's an 88 year old white lady. She's raised two sons. And you know, she, why would I want this woman to procreate? She wouldn't know how to be a mom. I completely agree with this lady. I completely agree. What I'm saying is as much as, you know, look, I I can't tell a woman whether to have a child or not to have a child. But what I will tell you is she needs to understand she's killing a baby. Good or bad. We have to agree on that. Now, do I want her to have kids? No, it's Martha Plimpton. These kids are look like trolls. Have you seen what was the movie? Goonies? <laughs> she, I couldn't tell if they were saying Martha Plimpton was a goonie or if it was a goonie that was a goonie. She looks like a goonie. But, you know, I get the difference between, oh, Kevin, if she didn't have the abortion, she would have had that baby or whatever. Yeah, but maybe her her actions would have changed. Maybe she would have picked a different dude. It's Martha Plimpton. I can't say that she would have. She doesn't get a lot of choices. But I'm not telling you I want liberal baby, liberal women having babies. But if you want to rationalize that to say, well, Kevin, there's a reason to kill a kid because she shouldn't have a baby. Many women who would make good mothers are making the decision to have abortions because of the peer pressure. And they're re- they are prepared to be good moms. I could have been aborted by my mother. My mother had my brother and, 15, and then six months later, she found out she was pregnant with me while she was in the process of leaving my dad. What do you think the average woman would have done today? I ain't going to have two kids by this crazy man. So I could have been aborted. 
So I take the the idea of abortion personally because I know in today's time, you might not be hearing my voice. Young black woman, you know, pregnant with her second baby by a derelict. <sighs> easy, easy choice there, baby cakes. So that's what I'm saying. So I understand, yeah, I don't want these stupid women having babies, but I want them making better choices. Don't be being proud that you're out killing people. That would be like Bundy going, yeah, you know, the first murder I had. Thanks, Seattle. Thanks for welcoming me. The first person I killed. Yeah, it was a, a college girl. She, I mean, she was a pretty little thing. She was, uh, you know, at the University of, Bla- University of Oregon. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I saw her. I, she was just so cute. I mean, she had this little spring flower dress on. And carrying her books and, you know, talking to another girl and I cased her, you know, and it was just, it, it was, it was a joy. And I did that right here. Yeah. Woo! Go Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. He's amazing. <laughs> Let me, so, so I would ask the lady that, that's mad at me for saying, I want people to not kill babies to explain to me what you would say if Ted Bundy were celebrating his first kill, you know? My second kill was even more exciting. It was thrilling, in fact. I'll tell you why. I go into the girl's dorm. Three of them are sleeping. You know, I kill all three of them with a hammer, a claw hammer. Yeah, not even a peep out of them, not a scream. You know, a hammer is very quiet. It's very quiet. You know, anyway, it was thrilling. It was exhilarating. In fact, go ahead and show the pictures. (laughs) I mean, what do you want me to say? So look, I don't want these people procreating any more than you. But I don't want people killing babies. And whatever Martha Plimpton does, it isn't what she did. It's the fact that Martha Plimpton potentially could influence tens, you know, dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands. You know how we have to kill the metric system when we when we say things in America. It could be tens. It could be hundreds. We have to say dozens. Anyway, it could be tens. It could be hundreds or thousands of girls get influenced by her. All these girls that are out there, yeah, I'm for abortion. Woohoo! Yeah, I don't want them having babies, but I want them not influencing young girls who are good, who may be out there killing kids. Because let me tell you what happens to those ladies. They grow up with a hatred in their soul. They don't know why. They're kill- they killed a kid, and they were told it was okay. And then it all comes flooding back. And then these girls end up choosing the wrong men. They, choose, they make lifestyle choices that no longer fit their morals and values. How do we change society if we just allow that? By saying, it's okay, Martha Plimpton, I don't want you to have babies anyway. I don't want her to have babies. She'd be a horrible mother. She's a horrible human being. But I'm still going to protect the baby. And you know what? I want to point out it's her pain that's speaking. It isn't her pride in having an abortion. It's her pain. That's what I said in the the post. It's Martha Plimpton's pain. She's not up there celebrating that. I mean, all jokes aside, I said, you know, she probably doesn't get a whole lot of choices getting laid, but it's her pain. It's what she misses about motherhood. I don't know if she's a mom now or whatever. Don't know, don't care. But I'll tell you this. She can't sit up there and tell me she's celebrating that. I know better than that. I know the psychology of people. And she was sharing her pain. And I would much rather Martha uh, Plimpton would go up there and say, you know what, girls? Don't make the wrong choices in men. If you're going to pick a guy to have sex with, pick the right guy. Pick a guy that you believe you're in a relationship with and you potentially could want to have his baby. That's how you pick your partners. You don't pick your partner because you get drunk or he's cute and have unprotected. In this day and time, is anyway, having unprotected sex. And I could go on. You don't do that. That's the message I want Martha Plimpton talking about. And the only way we're going to get her talking about it is if we can embarrass her. If we can embarrass the whole lot of them to say, look, I'm not telling you to go out and have babies. If you don't want to have kids, don't have them. But don't use abortion as birth control. Use your brain as birth control. Use your common sense. Use the the gifts that God gave you so that you can make a determination of do you want to have a baby by this man or not. Don't let doctors and, and lawyers tell you, oh, it was just a whatever. No, it was a baby. And you killed a baby. And I will protect those kids till the day I die. Anyway, we got a short break. We'll be back. Keep it in is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. 
My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here, author of Race Pimping, racepimping.com. And also, radio show host at the Kevin Jackson Radio Show, kjradio.com. I want to talk to you about the stupidity of liberalism as it pertains to the police. Now, you guys know, don't get the, don't go there. You know how much I love the police. I think these guys are awesome. I'm not telling you that all of them are great. But the majority of the police that I've run into are amazing guys. You find the occasional guy with a chip on his shoulder, and generally speaking, if you're nice to him, he he doesn't use the chip on you, right? The chip doesn't fall off on you. But for the most part, these guys are nice. They want to get home. You want them to get home. Be safe out there, brother, sister, whatever. Good for them. But occasionally they make a mistake. In the Portland, of course, what are we talking about? Portland, Oregon. <laughs> they have decided to do something in the police department that I find unbelievable. They're going to get rid of their gang database. Now, you know what gangs do. You know who gangs are. Now, this is no longer West Side Story. I don't know. Was it West Side Story? Was it the white boys against the Latinos? I think it was. I haven't seen this this show. I ain't gonna lie. I I almost saw it on Broadway and I was like, nah, it ain't worth it. And anyway, but I I, I haven't seen it. I've seen pieces of it. And I know Natalie Wood is in it because she was a dish. And I always like seeing Natalie Wood in anything. But I only saw bits and pieces where they're like, you know, the snap. (laughs) because <laughs> people don't gang fight like that but you know it's kind of like michael jackson's beat it video <laughs> that, that's not how they fight but anyway um i don't I, I, it got me thinking when i saw this story when is the last time i've actually heard of a white gang the only white gang that i know of are motorcycle gangs hell's angels and I believe they're mostly white. Are they all white? I don't know. I, Cause I think they're kind of racist too. I, I'm not sure. I don't want to cast the spurges on the hell's angels, but I, you know, it's not for everybody. I'll put it that way. They got a certain clientele that they, I think they call themselves like uh one percenters or three percenters. Or something, Cause it's like all the biker gangs in the country, 97 or whatever percentage are, are like totally benign. But these, one percent or three percent are like hellions and so i know there's like uh not the gypsies the the zombies <laughs> but there's hell's angels and there's another one because they they got into a fight in vegas i saw it on tv and one of my buddies is a member of the other one 
and he happened to be in Vegas at the time. And he was, he was telling us a story at the bar, like, man, that was something else. Cause it was shots ringing out and, you know, guys slugging it out. And I think the other gang outnumbered the hell's angels at the time and got the best of them. So they, those guys slug it out all the time, but those are the only, and, and again, and then the other gang allowed his Hispanics. I know that for a fact, not cause my buddy was a white dude, but I know they had Hispanics in the gang. Cause when I saw the, the whole, the thing, the hell's angels guys were, it seemed like they were all white and maybe, yeah, I don't know. I'm, again, I don't want to put them in the wrong light. They already got enough bad light as it is, but the other gang, oh, it starts with an M. Not the mobsters, but it, the the morph. God, it, it bugs me. I can't think of it. Can you guys look up just gangs, biker gangs, and tell me who it is? Because it'll it'll drive me crazy. But anyway, so the point is, those are the only white gangs I know, and they don't do business the way you know, like the Crips and the Bloods and the MS13 and all that. When you hear about gangs, it's generally Crips, Bloods. MS-13, the Zetas, you know, people like that. So it's either black or Hispanic. And occasionally you might hear of like the Japanese Yakuza in town or whatever, but it's so small. It's crazy. And certainly in Portland, Oregon, if you were trying to be in a Japanese game, man, you stick out like a kangaroo in a dinner jacket. So anyway, the Portland is decided that they're going to nix their gang database. And here's what the, the article says. Portland police will no longer maintain a database of suspected gang members due to concerns that the vast majority of people with the gang label are racial minorities. Now, you guys saw this coming. You know, I I tried to sneak it in on you with all that talk about the white gangs, but you knew what was coming. And the thing about it, how crazy is that? So they've got gangs on the streets in Portland and they say, you know what? We study these gangs, gang members, so when we're out and about, we know what's going on with the gang-related stuff. Gang-related stuff means they're dealing drugs, they're into prostitution, whatever. So you want to know who, when I stop somebody, I want to know, okay, I remember this guy from the gang database, and he is involved in murder for hire, whatever, and you know. So if there's a suspicion of something, you already know who you're dealing with. You got an idea of he's, he's, how dangerous is he? Is he an enforcer? Is he a, you know, just a, an earner? I don't know how gangs do their stuff, but whatever the, his rank is, you would know. But now the Portland police go, no, 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 we don't want to know that. We just want to go it on our own. We don't want anybody to believe that we're profiling gang members. Now, the, the thing you might be saying to yourself is, well, Kevin, are they saying that there are no white people in gangs? I guess. I'm sure in the gangs around Portland, there's the occasional wigger, that's what they call them, white dude who's joining, a, a, you know, the Crips. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing because, you know, Eminem is a rapper, right? So you have to figure there's got to be at least one dude that's in a black gang somewhere. Uh, do they join the Hispanic gangs? Maybe there's a white dude that speaks Spanish and he's part of the, you know, the whole gang scene over there. I don't know. But what I can tell you is from for the most part, white kids that I know are no longer doing a whole lot of gang banging. Now, I haven't been to the poor areas of town where white people live, but my suspicion is it's kind of played out. They just they're like, Psst, we're poor, but big deal. I haven't seen it. Maybe you guys can enlighten me. 844-551-8255. Maybe you are in a white gang. Maybe one of your kids are or your daughter. You know, who knows? I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I don't want it all to be boys. Maybe you know somebody, a white kid in a gang. I just don't. I mean, and I don't even hear about it. Starting October 15th, the Portland Police Bureau will end 20, the 20 year practice of issuing gang member designations, which people say can lead to, quote, unintended consequences and a lifelong stigma, even for those who've given up the gang lifestyle. I don't disagree with that. If you want to say, look, oh, Charlie, he used to be in a gang in the 60s, but he's he's 72. <laughs> you know, he's not gang. Man. I get that. But I don't get it for the kids that you still suspect being in the gangs. I don't get it. It says officials intend to notify approximately 300 people on the gang list bureau 
that the gangless bureau will purge all records related to the designation. So they're going to not only do it, they're going to tell them you've been you've been purged. City official and community activists have long urged the bureau to stop attaching the gang designation to criminal suspects, claiming the practice disproportionately impacted people of color. I wonder why Crips and Bloods. Why is it everybody knows who the heck a Crip or a Blood is? Because there's a lot of black folks in gangs. But we're going to solve the problem, typically, the way black liberals do, by pretending it doesn't exist. Yeah, that works every time, doesn't it? Certainly help black people in schools and, you know, in business and elsewhere. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Some things about the left just make me mad. They make me mad, boys. My grandpa would say, make me madder than a mule chewing on honeybees. <laughs> oh, Lord. I get mad. And, and it, because certain things just make no sense whatsoever. This is the Kevin Jackson Show, by the way. I am Kevin Jackson, KJ radio.com so kevin what are you so mad about what are you upset about my brother thank you for asking malcolm i'm sorry minister farrakhan (laughs) i'm mad because michelle obama was named best dressed i said it now how are you how do you feel michelle obama named best dressed by vanity fair you're, do you get vanity? You, I know you guys don't read Vanity Fair. You, you, you got a, your girlfriend? Does she read Vanity Fair? Vanity, not Van, 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 Vanity Fair. Does she? Does she read Vanity Fair? No. Good, because she's not a lefty, right? Okay, cool. She read Cosmo. Just curious. You've seen Cosmo laying around your place, haven't you? Cosmo's like a little step towards Vanity Fair. I'm telling you. Next thing you know, man, she's wearing Birkenstocks and tie dye and. Not, not shaving her armpits. Keep your eye on her. <laughs> Just say, yeah, okay. You feel safe. You feel safe. Good, 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 good. Just remember, fam- when I famous last words, I've warned you. You get rid of Cosmo. You don't need Cosmo anyway. Let me tell you about Cosmo. If you get Cosmo over say twenty issues, I promise you, you will see the same titles just repurposed. You know. Seven ways to light his fire. Light his fire in seven ways. <laughs> ways to light his fire in seven times. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing. It's just a regurgitation. How to tell if your man is cheating. How to tell if your man is into you. How to tell if your man is blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's it's crazy stuff. Or, you know, it'll be uh, how to fool your man with me. How to make your bra look bigger than, you know, your chest look bigger than it really is or whatever. How to, you know, whatever. Accent your body. This bathing suit can fit you. It isn't. Whatever it is, I promise you, they've done three titles of it over a 12 to 20 month period, say 24 months. It's the same title repurposed. And don't dare go over the history of Vanity Fair outside of, you know, things changing with the times. It's the same old drivel. Women want it. They want it. Whatever. Michelle Obama named best dressed. What do you what do you even say to that? Have you honestly, have you followed her couture? I've looked at her couture, and occasionally Michelle Obama might wear a dress that you go, that's stylish. Yeah, that's okay on her. But that's about it. That is as big a compliment as you can get out of me from Michelle Obama's dresses. And I'm not trying to be cruel. People will listen to me saying this, and, oh, Kevin, you just don't like the Obamas. I don't care. If Obama likes dating a, a chick that kind of is dudish, good for him. There are guys that like that. They're kind of effeminate and they like a stronger woman. I mean, Michelle Obama has beautiful arms for a dude. And, you know, there are women, you know, that you want them to see, get, get the, you know, the form in their arms. I don't, I, I will admit, you know, when you see a woman with jiggly arms, you kind of want to say, Hey, come, I'll help you, you know, in the weight room with that. Cause you can't, uh, I mean, I, I've never had jiggly arms, but I can't imagine, you know, going to move something and then there's still being activity <laughs> after I do it. Like I'm writing on the chalkboard and it's still activity, you know, hoo, 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 while my arm is moving. I'm just saying, and people will get mad at me. Kevin, you're fat shaming. I'm not fat shaming. 
My grandmother had jiggly arms because she, my grandmother probably weighed, I think she weighed one, when she was younger, she weighed 156. And then when she got a little older, she got up to like 170. And then she, she started losing weight when she got like in, in her 80s. And she probably went down to like 140. She got a little skinny. But my grandmother had, not not bad, but she, she had a little fat under the, you know, under her arm at her tricep. And women get that. They, they know this. It's one of the first places that, the you know, the, the fat tends to go. And, you know, but she didn't have what I would call jiggly arms, but she had, you know, chunky arms. But Michelle Obama got dude arms. That's just it. it, it and, and I know people go, well, Kevin, women can work out. You're exactly right. But hers are just, you know, a little more toned for, than for probably most guys. And I got friends that bodybuild and stuff like that, women friends. And, you know, it's a good look. I mean, if you're into kind of girls that are built like guys, one of two of my friends are bodybuilders and they are just, you know, I mean, in my best shape, I didn't look like them. And I ain't even joking. Just too much for me, though. Anyway, the left, they pretend to never get enough of the Obamas and they'll do just about anything to make the world believe in their undying devotion to the royal black pair. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Barack Obama given a Nobel Peace Prize while he fought three wars abroad and created a civil war inside America. Had black people hating white people more than ever. Meanwhile, Michelle Obama's starving school kids oversaw the biggest waste of food in modern history. If she were a Republican first lady, people would be, they'd call her a food junker or something. They'd give her a name. She'd have a nickname. Unbelievable. Oh, but that's right. The president, the first lady, the formers, they're black. So the fawning continues. Why? Because they're black. Listen, you look, I know y'all don't want to say it, but it's true. Eight months into the Trump administration and the ruse of the Obamas continues. The left continue pining away for their beloved Obamas. Lest they force themselves to admire real royalty. That would be the Trump family. And in its continued subterfuge, Vanity Fair named Michelle Obama best dressed as they honor their annual fashionistas. This year, Michelle Obama, she got it. And just for shiggles, I'm going to ask you this. Do you believe the leftist fashion rag put lovely fashion model turned first lady Melania Trump in their magazine? Hmm? What do you think? So the Daily Caller says this. Vanity Fair celebrated the world's royalty and celebrities in its annual best dress list published on Wednesday. Inductees included Prince Philip, Queen Letizia of Spain, Justin Trudeau of, uh, he's from Canada, Emmanuel and Brigitte Macron from France, and of course, Barack and Michelle Obama. Mm-hmm. This year's list seems to overrepresent politicians and royalty. Sure, some celebrities are to be expected, like Rihanna, who's been the face of Dior. But did Prince Philip really deserve to be in this year's running? He's 96 and rarely in the public eye. And where's Melania Trump? You know, the first lady and also the Slovenian immigrant who was a fashion model until 2016. Neither of these women has a patent on black heels and stripes, but I might go as far as to say that Melania looks better than Michelle. That was the end of their article. Now I went further. I said the only way Michelle Obama beats Melania in anything related to looks or fashion is with a steep affirmative action curve. I don't even know if you have a curve that large. And for the record, that's not a criticism of Michelle Obama necessarily. But let's face it, folks. Stevie Wonder can see that Melania is heads and shoulders better looking, more elegant, and more sophisticated than Michelle Obama. Period. And I know that vexes the left. When, whenever you say anything about the royal black family, people just go crazy. Kevin, you hate on Michelle Obama. I can't believe Michelle Obama. What? 
What? Look, do this. Go back to the first time Barack Obama got elected and Michelle Obama wore the black widow suit. It was a black dress with a red hourglass and I'm not lying. And go look at Melania Trump in her blue, you know, what? no, she wore the white. No, at the convention, she wore the white. At the inauguration, she wore blue. Go look at what Melania wore either time and just, <laughs> excuse me, just, just to pose, just to pose the um, image side by side and tell me which one do you find more elegant or less elegant or whatever. Do it. I dare you. I'll wait. <laughs> Actually, I can't wait. This is radio. But if you do it, you will come back with the same conclusion as I do. Ray Charles is rolling over in his grave if you tell him that um, M- Michelle Obama should be on the best dress list. By the way, neither should Barack Obama and versus the Trump family. Please. And, you know, I, I was... I said this when the Melania went down to talk about the, uh, to you know, deal with the hurricane. I wrote of her and I said, for the first time in my adult life, I'm proud of America's first lady. And my statement was intentionally melodramatic, but only to drive home a point as Michelle Obama did years ago. While Michelle Obama may have only been proud to be an American after Barack Obama's election, I'm proud, proud to be a conservative woman. <laughs> I mean, man. <laughs> Look at America's new first lady. Whether you think of Michelle Obama, whatever you think of her, Melania set the standard. That's just a fact. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. I'm amazed that the left works so hard to disrespect the Trump family. And they think they're they're making an impact on this the first couple. They really do. They think you l- let me put you in the mindset of a billionaire with a trophy wife or a trophy wife who's married to a billionaire. Take your pick. They don't care. There's nothing you can tell them that's going to flap them. They are unflappable. Oh, she didn't make the best dress list. Who cares? Do you think Melania Trump's going, gosh, Donald, I cannot believe that they didn't put me in Vanity Fair for the best dress. I mean, I feel as though I dress better than Michelle Obama. I don't even know how Melania talks because I don't hear her talk very much. But do you think she's concerned? Do you think she was concerned when Sophie Theolette said, I won't make her, uh, I'm, I'm not going to make Melania Trump dresses. I dress Michelle Obama, but I won't dress for Melania Trump. Do you think Melania Trump was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? The woman who dressed Michelle Obama, the f- and I'm using my finger quotes, the fashion designer. You have to say that like Elmer Fudd, if you, because you can't take it seriously. The fashion designer. Because you can't take it seriously. Sophie Theolette if you dressing Michelle Obama is your definition of being a fashion designer, then Kevin Jackson is a fashion designer. I'm a fashionista. I should just become gay and put on a fedora and go, okay, I'm now a fashion designer because Sophie Theolette can be one. So can I. I looked at a whole slew of dresses that this lady designed for Michelle Obama. And I promise you, not a single bit of innovation that I, I didn't see anything that I went, whoa. I saw one where I went like, okay, that's all right. But the majority of them, I was saying, you got to be kidding. 
You've got to be kidding. I, I, I could have given you 15 ways I said you've got to be kidding. 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 You get what I'm saying? And I'm not kidding. They hate her. They hate Melania Trump, who they would meet in almost any other circumstances except with their husbands or, you know, whatever. Because they, they, you know how women are. They would just hate on Melania for no other reason. They just hate her. She's pretty, probably very soft spoken, you know, very elegant. She's elegant. Somebody described her. One of my friends said, Kevin, she's rather Jackie O. I would agree. She's got an elegant. I think she's more elegant than Jackie O personally. And you know what I really liked during Hurricane Harvey when she dressed down, put on the cap that said Flotus, white shirt, black pants. Pow. She rocked it. Even dressing down, you were like, whoa, check out Melania. You go, girl. Yeah, it's your bad self. Huh? Got old James Brown on me, boy. I was like, huh? Get some. Dun, 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 dun. Hey. Because it was just so cool to see her not worry about being elegant. And she rocked it. I remember when Michelle Obama went, you know, like oh natural and she came off of a plane somewhere in like Italy. She was on vacation with the daughters and secret service. And it was like, yikes. And they said those tennis shoes she wore were like 650 bucks. They were tennis shoes. They were like a canvas tennis shoe with a pattern. 650 bucks. And I was thinking if Barbara Bush wore $650 tennis shoes. People would be livid. They would be, look at her showing our bell lavish. But Michelle Obama does it. Ooh. They, 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 whoever designed those shoes, I don't remember who it is. But they were like blowing up because people were like, oh, Michelle Obama wore, you know, some Cavinos or whatever they were. They weren't Cavinos, but whatever they were. Maybe I should have a line of shoes called Cavinos. Get somebody on the left to wear them. Maybe I get Kim Kardashian to wear my Cavinos. But I digress. What I really wanted to talk about was celebrity chefs. I told you, people hate the Trumps. They don't even know why. They're they're told you must hate the Trumps. This is the the left. They say, you got to hate the Trumps. Don't come to my cocktail party telling me things like, you know, I've been really paying attention to Donald Trump and it's not, old chap's not doing that bad. You'll never come back to my party. Get out. And people are looking over and they see it. So they go and do. So, Bill, what do you think about the Trumps? Ah, I can't stand them. But I do love these hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> hey, can you have Charles send over another drink? <laughs> Shoot. These bourgeois cocktail sippers. That's what I call them. Bourgeois cocktail sippers. They want to be so relevant. They want you, you to, for you to make the jet set. You've got to think like them. Because if you if you don't think like them, you don't get invited to the parties. You don't get invited. Let me, is that your bag? I, be honest, conservatives. I, look, I'm I'm up for a party. I, there are times where I go, why am I not getting invited to speak over here or there? I'm I'm not on the list. I'll be blunt. I have to. My team we, we scratch and claw to get me into stuff. And people probably, Kevin, with your personality and your good looks and charm. <laughs> I did that intentionally because I knew y'all would look up. I knew you guys would look up and be like, whatever. Look, if you're going to look up, look up. But don't roll your eyes when you look up because then you get me mad. And then I'm not talking to the audience anymore. I'm talking to my producers. Anyways, I was saying <laughs> that of other people saying of me, <laughs> Kevin, with your, your personality, your good looks and your charm, surely you get invited to everything. And it's just not true. I don't get invited. I find out about stuff after the fact. They have Jonah Goldberg there. And I'm like, okay, congratulations. Or Bill Crystal. Have you met? Look, you probably haven't met Bill Crystal. Don't invite Bill Crystal to. He's monotone. Because Donald Trump, he's, uh, of course, he's a moron. And uh, I, I listen to these guys. I'm like, really? Why would you pay the kind of coin it takes to get Bill Crystal to come out to hear this dude, you know, with, Try to be William F. Buckley without the without the skills, you know, <laughs> waste of space. But people invite these guys. They're, they're like in the in crowd. And, and those guys are in the in crowd because they don't like Trump. So they walk. They, they get two sides of the fence. They got the rhinos and they got the Democrats. 
because they can go to anything. So they charge Democrats twenty five, fifty thousand dollars to come bash Trump. If I wanted to make that kind of money bashing Trump, I could just go, yeah, man, I switched over. I, Donald Trump is a mess. And if I put the word out or a press release, leftists would light me up. Kevin, uh, we'd love to invite you to our gathering. Rhinos would light me up. I'd be speaking at Paul Ryan's house with people opening their wallets up to give me money on the fly. That's just how, how it is. They can't stand Trump. And you know why? It's very simple. Trump is successful. Trump is accountable. I'm not talking about successful in his own right as a person. I'm talking about successful as a president. As much as they've tried to throw things in his way, thwart him at all, at all, every turn, he's successful. This travel ban. You guys heard about this? Travel ban. Gone. I mean, it's in place. They finally approved it. Any hoopla over that? No, maybe we'll talk more about it in a bit. Because I want to talk about Hollywood and their hatred of Trump. For no reason, not even knowing why. It's like black people hate Republicans. And you go, why? Man, because uh, they, they invoke slavery. No, they freed the slaves. Oh, man, you lying. Democrats feed the slaves. No. Nope. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat, boy. You know, no, no, he was a Republican. <laughs> and you could go on. I could tell you the silliest stuff I've heard from black folks that's completely wrong. And you start straightening them out. And they're like, oh, dude, I got, I'm going to have to look that up. Well, it would be the first thing you've looked up. Anyway, Anthony Bourdain, I can't stand this guy. And, you know, I watch a lot of cooking shows. I know, secret shame. I've, I've revealed it. And occasionally, you know, uh, say yes to the dress, <laughs> you know, just as a drive-by. But I'll, I'll get stuck on it because I'll see some girl acting nutty and I got to watch it. And occasionally, rich housewives, because it's the same reason. I'm not seeking these things out. My TV may just be on it because the previous thing I was watching on that channel. Don't, don't try to judge. Don't judge me. Anyway, Bourdain says he would dish poison if Donald Trump and Kim Jong Il made reservations for two. Yeah, they. Um, he do, he has a, a thing, a show called Parts Unknown, and it's funny. I would see this guy. He's a good-looking guy, you know, chef guy, you know, typical. He looks like Sam Malone kind of thing, and um, on Cheers, and I would see him, and I was like, oh, he seems like a good guy. You know, he's a he's a chef, very respected, and. When I just saw him as a chef, I liked the guy. Then he started getting political. And it's okay. Look, if you want to tell me I like Hillary, I don't like Trump. No problem. But when you say, I would poison the president. And then he he, he essentially equates him with Kim Jong-un by saying, here's what he says. Uh, he, call, he calls Kim Jong-un a chubby, evil little F. I've heard this guy on other shows unplugged where on cable and the dude is foul. He's a foul mouth bully. That's too caught up in the idea that he can throw some ingredients together. When did chefs get this rock star? I mean, look, I love going to Spago and eating at, you know, different chefs, restaurants and all that. But seriously, when did they become so egotistical to believe that they could talk about politics? won't stop until he's the top rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. What's up everybody? Kevin Jackson here. How do they do it? That's what I want to know. And you're wondering, what in the heck is Kevin Jackson of the Kevin Jackson Show talking about when he asked the question, how do they do it? How do they pick the worst city in America? That's what I want to know. Hey, if you want to reach out to me, kjradio.com, or you can call me at 844-551-8255. If you are listening to this program and you live in what I call an urban indoctrination center, a.k.a. a city, do you live in a cesspool? It doesn't even matter what it is. It could be Salem, Oregon. It could be Portland, Oregon. I got a lot of folks up there. It could be Cleveland, Ohio. It could be Chicago, Illinois. It doesn't matter. Some, you know, relative to others, you, you, you'll you say, well, Portland, it's the, the great white north. So it's got le- fewer problems than, say, Cleveland, Ohio or Detroit. But it's got problems because it's a city that's run by liberals, leftists. 
no question, progressives, and they are running it into the ground little by little. And the only thing that bails them out is everything that surrounds them. All that farmland, all those good rural folk that talk a little bit differently, that slow down, have good sensibilities about themselves, have this thing called common sense. So how do you determine what is the worst city in America? Let's let, let's throw some names out. OK, I've given you Baltimore. I think I did. We've got Cleveland. We've got Chicago. We've got Los Angeles. We've got Detroit. We've got Atlanta. You know, Oakland, Compton. How many do you need? How many do you want? I got plenty. I got a lot of them. Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Austin, Texas. Go to Arkansas, Tulsa, Oklahoma City. D.C., San Antonio and the Liberty Town, Austin and the Baton Rouge. <laughs> or maybe it was Boston. Yeah, Boston and Baton Rouge. Tulsa, Austin, or Oklahoma City, Seattle, San Francisco. When they hear the music, I'm doing so. I have to remember the towns by quoting Huey Lewis. But it doesn't matter where you go. You got lots of crime. You got lots of cover up. You got people going, let's clean up the city so people don't realize how filthy dirty it is. <laughs> That's what de Blasio, de Blasio is like. Now, look, let's pick up the city. They got people coming in. It's like your parents. when they say, look, be sure to pick up your room. We got company coming over. You know, everybody help pick up around here. That's what would happen. The cities are the same way. <laughs> Go pick stuff up. Get Throw that trash out. Somebody get some air freshener. <laughs> Don't you know some of these nasty cities wish they could just turn on a big old fan with air freshener. <laughs> oh, man. God, just filthy. Harry Reid talked about it. He says, D.C., I tell you, in the summer, it's really nasty. These uh, these foreigners come in and, hey, hey, let's just put, uh, being honest, they're stinky. They're stinky people. <laughs> you remember when he said that? Y'all, you, y'all, I mean, you're old enough. Don't act like you're not old enough. But yeah, Harry Reid actually said that. He said foreigners are funky. Funky foreigners. Won't you take me to Funky Town? <laughs> funky Town is D.C. <laughs> oh, man. See, we are musical people. Black folks are musical people. Funky Town. So. It's it's funny to me that they would try to figure out what's the worst. Where's the worst town to live? What do you think it is? The worst town. What do you believe is the worst city to live? I don't even know the, the, the statistics of what makes it that. Is it crime rate? Is it access to opportunity? Is it, you know, for example, unemployment? Is it tourism? What do they measure on? And I got the article here, so I, I didn't even read it. All I saw was who was named the worst town. Who do you think it was? I've given you a lot of choices. By the way, the city I, the city it was is not in those choices. I know. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. I've given you Detroit, Boston. No, yeah, I did Boston because you lose. Cleveland, uh, Chicago, did I do New York, New York, San Francisco. I mean, you name it. And the town's not even in there. You need a hint? It's not a big city. Oh, let me just be the deal breaker. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, I'm going to spoiler, spoiler alert. All right. It's St. Louis. The city I just moved from St. Louis is the worst town in America. Worst city. No, no, I'm sorry. Worst city in Missouri. Oh, shoot. Well, that kind of blows everything I just said, doesn't it? I bet it's the worst town in America, though. <laughs> this article says worst town in Missouri city's poor standing largely attributed to economic decline brought on by lack of population growth and waning manufacturing sector. Let me tell you why St. Louis is the worst town to live in, in the country. They don't want to say it, but it's true. Let me tell you why. Number one, St. Louis at the turn of the 20th century. I'm talking 1905 population, 860,000, give or take St. Louis population in 2017, 318,000. Now, in a hundred plus years, this city has managed to shrink by almost two thirds. That's sickening. You're talking about Chicago went from eight, they were, believe it or not, Chicago and St. Louis were roughly the same size 
at the turn of the 20th century. Chicago's now millions of people. You could put the downtown of St. Louis in a two block radius of Chicago's downtown. Not even, you may not even take you that much. Maybe just take a block. It's crazy how big and how successful. And by the way, Chicago's still a, an armpit. Don't misunderstand me. But they figured out how to make money. They gouge everybody there. But St. Louis did not, they gouge and can't even build a city. Many of the economic problems in St. Louis are tied to the city's rapid population decline. City's population is less than half of what it was during the peak. It's 1950 peak of 860,000 people, and it continues to decline. While the population grew 11.5% in the last 10 years, the number of residents in St. Louis fell 5.4%. Now think about those numbers. To find the worst city in each state, 24-7 Wall Street examined approximately 550 cities across the country with populations over 65,000 residents in 2015. They looked at data in nine categories, crime, demography, economics, education, environment, health, housing, infrastructure, and leisure, and made a final judgment. Worst cities in neighboring states, Illinois, Rockford, Kansas City, Kansas, which by the way, shares its border with St. Louis, Missouri, with Kansas City, Missouri, Iowa, Des Moines, Arkansas, Fort Smith. What they're telling you folks is wherever the city has a decent sized population, it stinks. That's it in a nutshell. Anyway, we got a lot to talk about. St. Louis. Woohoo! Way to go, girls. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state? The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. Beth Cook Moranville author of Closer Than Your Breath, A Book of Hope. Hope, that wonderful, wonderful four-letter word that you may feel completely out of. I wrote this book to give you great hope. It's not too late. If fetal position is an all-too-familiar place for you, I understand. If the next 60 seconds are too long, this book is for you. Wherever you are right now, whether you're dealing with divorce or death or sickness, take hope. You are going to make it through this pain. Don't roll your eyes. I've walked this road and I know it. The best is yet to come. Closer Than Your Breath, a book of hope from author and speaker Beth Cook Moranville can be found on Amazon.com or Kindle.com. For more information, visit CloserThanYourBreath.com or on Facebook at Closer Than Your Breath. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson here. Yeah. We were just talking about me screwing up the last segment, talking about St. Louis is the worst city in the country and is the worst city in Missouri. Like that's, you know, really? That's like saying uh, the worst city in Illinois is Chicago. Surprise. The worst city in Cleveland is, is Baltimore. Really? I'm shocked. You know what I mean? Come on. We know that. But the decline of St. Louis, I can't even imagine somebody. 1950, 850,000 people. All right. Now, 318,000. Since the 1950s. That's just ridiculous. And let me tell you, St. Louis is the race relations in St. Louis are horrendous. I talked to a lady who didn't even know it. She's like, I'm shocked. 
She she was shocked when I said race relations under Obama were far less, far worse. She she was like, hey, where are you getting this information? What are you talking about? She couldn't believe what I said. I told you guys a story. I flew with her on a plane, she and her husband, and she admitted. She goes, Kevin, I'm not political. I, you know, I'm just seeking my own inner peace. And I go, well, congratulations to you, you know, because I think that's good. I think we need to sometimes pull back and go, you know what? I'm not going to get caught up in all the, the rigmarole, as my grandmother would say. Boy, get away from all that rigmarole. <laughs> I love that word, rigmarole. <laughs> but she would tell me. Don't bring me all that rigmarole. I never knew what it was. Is that really? I mean, rigmarole. Look it up. But it's it's good to pull back from the rigmarole and 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 get inside of yourself and just say home and find some peace. Because let me tell you, it's crazy out there. This lady couldn't believe it. She, you would you would almost have to be a hermit to not see how bad race relations are in this country. Honestly, am I right? You would almost have to be a hermit. I mean, videos of knockout gangs and flash black flash mobs and the amount of crime that's done. And, you know, what about these kids that, that beat up this little white boy on, on Facebook or something? You remember that? They beat this kid up and made, made him say, you know, cause I, I'm, y'all beat me up because I'm white or whatever. It was a complete racial incident for black kids. And he was a developmentally delayed, like a 21 year old guy. They were you know, beating in his scalp, cutting his scalp, cutting his hair. I mean, it was, it was sorry, just ridiculous. It was one of those things where if I'd seen him, I'd have beat the crap out of all four of them. Yeah. Including the girl. She deserved it too. You don't do that to a a developmentally delayed young man who he doesn't even have a, a malicious bone in his body. Okay. I wouldn't hit the girl. (sighs) Y'all so sensitive. She's a hoodlum. Anyway, I'll tell you about another lady. We want to talk about race relations. Um, she pushed an old white dude, 80 year old white man down in a bus. Because he was sitting towards the front, cursing him out, telling him he needs to move to the back of the bus. He gets up, she pushes him down to the floor. Now, all this started with Barack Obama. His response to Gates Gate, you know, where the white police officer in Cambridge was accused of racism by the Harvard professor Henry Gates. And Obama immediately sided with Gates, alluded that the white officer had overreacted to the incident because the professor was black. As it turns out, the professor overreacted. Not the police officer. The police officer was doing his job. And I reminded her of Black Lives Matter, a movement built on a lie told by black folks. Hands up, don't shoot. He just walked right up and shot that poor black man. He just shot him in his face dead. He just shot him. Lie. He had his hands up. Don't shoot. Total lie. Michael Brown was trying to kill a cop. Ran back at the cop. Charged him. Unbelievable. Good police officer. Darren Wilson gets fired. His boss gets fired. Chief Tom Jackson. Hey, bonus, bonus BLM. You got two white guys out of a job. Then Ferguson goes out and what do they do? They hire a black dude. Two white guys out of a job. They hire a black guy. And the black guy goes, I want to get more black cops. But he haven't, I haven't hired a single black cop in Ferguson. What about the two the administrators at the University of Missouri who got fired because some black dude walking down campus claims that some hillbilly in a red truck yelled the N word to him. They took him to the chancellor and the chancellor didn't respond quickly enough. <laughs> and so the number two guy gets resigns and the chancellor ultimately quits. I don't know who they got. You think probably replace them with two black people. Don't send your kids to the University of Missouri. By the way, the endowment for the University of Missouri fell six million dollars instantaneously. People said, I'm not donating to that school anymore. I'd love to have their database. I'd reach I'd write to every one of those alumni and say, don't donate to them. Donate to me and I'll make sure they never do something like that at your school ever again. It could be done. 
We recently recently documented these this black chick that gave guidelines to white people to assuage their guilt. She came up with a list of things they could do to make up for their years of being white. Yeah. White people, if you don't have any descendants, will your property to a black or brown family, preferably one that lives in generational poverty. That was the first one of the things that she wants you to do. Give your money to somebody at Poe who's black or brown. Generationally poor. Not just happen to fall upon hard times, but you know, took taking a risk trying to build a business or something. But no, somebody who's generationally poor. Because of course they really know what to do with the money. They're like lotto winners. And a host of other crazy things that this woman goes, this is what black people need to, white people need to be doing to make up for that, all that bad stuff. Clearly, black leftists have issues, unresolved daddy issues, unresolved, uh, I don't know, slavery issues, Martin Luther King or Abraham Lincoln issues, because they always are asking for something. So this elderly white dude is on a bus. Black woman walks on, shoves him to the floor with a racial slur. Told him to sit to the back of the bus. The suspect, they say, was between 30 to 40 years old. She's still being sought. 6.30 a.m., 80-year-old man boards the M15 city bus. Sat up front. Why wouldn't he? He wants to get out fast. He's 80. She gets onto the bus, gets, takes exception that he would dare sit at the front of the bus, says, you white honky mother blinky blink she said it several times get to the back of the bus and at some point the dude gets up he's a you know gonna apparently get to the back of the bus so he can just leave she can be left alone and she shoves him wrong on so many levels a lack of respect for her elders a lack of decorum period right just complete a-holism to the hilt but thankfully the guy appears to be doing okay That's another instance. I'm going to tell you right now where that woman needed to get her butt kicked. Oh, Kevin, you shouldn't hit a woman. Yeah, but she should go hit an 80 year old man. Right. With no repercussions. I get my sister to whoop her butt because that's what she needed. See, this is the type of racism that has been fomented by Obama that he doesn't want to take credit for and need to do the left. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. Welcome back, everybody. Kevin Jackson, shake it off, shake it off, da, 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 shake it off. Is that a Katy Perry song? Katy, I don't know. I know she did I kissed the girl and I liked it I know she did that that's a Katy Perry song it, this is like a beef between Katy Perry and Taylor Swift right like Taylor Swift's winning that beef Taylor Swift is killing it I don't and look I don't follow her music or Katy Perry's music or whatever but Taylor Swift's killing it she gets awards and she seems to be making money and doing okay. I, I mean, I'm just guessing, but she seems like she's doing all right. Who, are, who's that? Can I wonder if the audience can they hear those beeps? People just keep trying to get to us while we're on the show. What do you want? Is that a Facebook message? Yeah. Can we do it to where I don't know if they can hear it or not, but we need to do it to where they can't hear it. Because I can hear it in my micro in my headphones, not in my microphone. I can hear it in my headphones. If I get it in my microphone, then we would be in big trouble because it would be all messed up. Um, Katy Perry. She's. I can only guess that things aren't going that well for Katy Perry. Maybe she's as bad off as Johnny Depp and Alyssa Milano. Yeah, we talked about them. Johnny Depp is in like massive debt. He's selling off everything. It's a fire sale. This dude sold some property in Lexington, Kentucky, that I wish I had the the money to buy it. It's it's a steal right now. He's reducing the price. What is it like? Two point nine mil now for. 42 acres with a 6,000 square foot house on it. And you know, it's got to be a pretty fly house to be. I mean, I know Johnny Depp's a weirdo, but I bet you that house is nice. I mean, 6,000 square foot house in Lexington is not a, I mean, you probably pay half a mil, but 42 acres. I wonder if it's got like a, a lake on it or something. But anyway, he's, he's in a fire sale because he owes a lot of money and 
He divorced this girl he was with. He, they said Depp had, I don't know how many properties, like 10 properties. It's crazy. He was in, in debt. Alyssa Milano, get this. This girl was doing a renovation on a $5 million house in somewhere in, in uh, California, which means it was about a thousand square feet because <laughs> you don't get a lot of house there. But, uh, and then couldn't pay the bills, couldn't pay contractors and blamed her management company. Well, we didn't know that we had to pay these other taxes over here and this, that. Cause she owes, she owes the city wherever the house is like $380,000 in back taxes on that. You know, she's struggling. This girl has gone from like, what's that show? The witch show, you know, on a, I don't know, lifetime TV or something. She's gone from being a movie star to, to, to hawking like those things I've fallen and I can't get up. Now, see, if I was hawking, <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up, I would be on the upswing because I, I don't even do D-list stuff. But for her, that's a fall from grace. Goodness gracious. What in the world? I look at these people that have made crazy money. We pro, who was it? Nicholas Cage lost like a hundred million dollars. Tom Sizemore broke all these dudes. And I don't know their politics. The reason why I know Alyssa Milano and Johnny Depp, because they made comments against, you know, the president Trump. And so I tracked them. Cause you know, I'm like secret service on these Hollywood people that make you know negative comments against a dude who's doing so well. Cause I'm thinking you should be happy, man. The, the Hollywood, I call them Hollywood. They should be ecstatic that Trump is president because all they got to do is stop bashing him and make a decent movie, make some films. We want to see, we will be all cool. The same thing with these entertainers. They should be ecstatic. That increases our expendable income. Lord knows I'm even contemplating going to see wicked. (laughs) You know, that's good. You got to take the family to see some, anything you got to spend some coin, right? Well, I'm, I'm going, okay, maybe we'll go do that. Taking my little boy to, to the batting cage a little more often, stuff like that. That's what, when the economy is good, people benefit, but you know what? They don't care. The left don't get, they, they care about it because they don't think it's going to impact them. And then suddenly it impacts them. We're not buying their, their downloads for their music. We're not buying their CDs. We're not buying their books. We're not buying, we're not watching their TV shows like the NFL, right? We're not shopping at their stores, Target. We're not buying their coffee, Starbucks. We're not going to their movies. Worst movie season, they said, I don't know, in like a decade, since 2009, I heard. Movie summer. Worst movie summer. And you know, uh, the the private filmmakers are they're doing okay. He's talking to Kevin uh, Sorbo, who's a buddy of mine. He's like, yeah, man. He goes, uh, you know, I'm Kevin. I'm making these, you know, three to five million dollar films. And he goes, and we, you know, we get our money back. We make a little bit of coin, and we make the next movie. He's not making these Hollywood hundred million dollar things, fifty million dollar budgets, whatever. But he's got he's doing films that he believes in. And he's make, you know, making a little bit of money doing it, living a good life. Good for Kev. He's going to do the voiceover for our film, Bleeding Blue. You can go see it at bleedingbluemovie.com. And hey, I'll tell you, we made our movie for a lot less than Kev. Yeah. And it's finished. One of my friends I met, his name is Mike. Mike was g- good enough. He says, Kevin, we need to finish that film. We told him and he goes, I got it. And he writes us a check for it right then and there. Gotta love that stuff. Good people you meet out in the conservative world. Good friend of mine talked to him the other night. John Bruner ran for governor in the state of Missouri, and uh, he's stepped away. And he's like, "Yeah, Kev, I still want to do some things." He goes, "We're gonna put some things together," and uh, he's he's just dying to do stuff with my team. You know, there are a lot of people out there, good folks, and and they're tired of watching what's happening and seeing how you know, pop culture and the media are ruining us, you know, making crazy stuff. I got a phone call from a friend of mine. We got a project. If it comes together, I swear it is amazing if we're able to put this thing together. So I'm going to be working with him to make something happen that could be pretty impressive if I can put it together with Tea Party community. So uh, more to come. But anyway, here's what I want to talk about. Uh, Katy Perry. She's selling her concert tickets 
on Groupon. I saw that, and when I see Groupon, I think of something Spanish, like Groupon. She's selling her tickets on Groupon. Like it's a, you know, somewhere in Mexico, a big stadium. Are you going to Groupon? I'm going if I can get myself a ticket. Okay, you go. I'll go too. <laughs> Groupon. You know what that is, right? Yeah. That's like the discount ticket hub. The two for one, the two for site, pretty much. And see, we warn these people. Stop with the Trump hate. Hillary Clinton, remember she, I think, didn't she bring Katy Perry in for one of her events? Hillary Clinton couldn't get an audience outside of bringing in somebody special. So she did an event somewhere in California. Katy Perry was, Katy Perry will be at the event. She fills the venue. Katy Perry sings a song or two, goes up and says, I love Hillary Clinton. She's amazing. And I hate Donald Trump because he grabs women by the naughty bits. Anyway, got to break, 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 shake, 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 shake. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Taylor Swift. And No, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Taylor Swift does shake it off. I think so. I get those two white girls mixed up. Anyway, <laughs> Katy Perry, when she leaves, her audience leaves. Nobody cared about Hillary Clinton. I just want to say that Donald Trump does not deserve to be president and I'm going to beat him and we're going to move women's agenda forward. Forward, ladies. And then, boom, everybody left. Same thing with black folks and Jay-Z and Beyonce. As soon as Jay-Z and Beyonce finished, (laughs) Hillary Hillary Clinton did it the wrong way. She spoke at the end. (laughs) When she had all those black folks in that stadium in Cleveland or wherever it was, and Beyonce and Jay-Z and Barack Obama. She should have said, before they perform, y'all got to sit through 30 minutes of me. Because the minute that Jay-Z and B, yeah, Beyonce finished, sw- <laughs> black people were like, Hillary who? Shoot, gone. Like a turkey through the cone. But yeah, so Katy Perry apparently is hitting it, feeling it in the pocketbook. The wrath of conservative America has hit entertainment. And I love it. I hope she's the, the one of many casualties to come because this mega superstar star apparently isn't so mega. Can't fill her seats on a new tour. Resorted to selling her tickets on Groupon. Yeah, this is the Daily Caller. As Katy Perry continues her downward spiral, she's taken to Groupon to sell tickets at a significantly reduced cost. What do you think these tickets cost? Groupon. Upper level, $9. Upper, three twelve, three eleven was 9 bucks. Other one's $10. Last month, she announced she was postponing her tour due to, quote, unavoidable production delays. They don't happen to people like her. They don't happen to Britney Spears and Taylor Swift. Unavoidable production rela- delays means nobody wants to see, witness the tour. She can't sell it out, folks. Nine dollars for a ticket. That's a new low. She's going to have to make a sex tape. That's all there is to it. Because if she's just trying to do it now on top, forget it. Go talk to Kim Kardashian and get some life experience, girlfriend, because you are not going to sell out the Witness the Tour Tour unless you do something dramatic. That's it. Kevin Jackson on the Black Sphere Radio Network. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS or state The secret to avoiding the IRS nightmare is to seek professional representation. My friends at Security Tax Associates provide the most cost-effective and ethical representation in the industry while helping to avoid seizures, levies, and wage garnishments. Security Tax Associates is here to ensure that the appropriate steps are taken to permanently eliminate any possibility of future tax burdens once and for all. For a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Security Tax Associates, 844-779-4177. That's 844-779-4177. 844-779-4177. Or visit them at securitytaxassociates.com. to identity politics. This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show. 
Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Is that Katy Perry? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Kevin Jackson, it's Kevin Jackson's show. I'm messing with my white boys. Because, see, I know that that's Britney. But I like to mess with them. Because, I, I don't, I, honestly, I don't know these young white girls. I don't know Ariane. I do kind of know Ariana because she says that high voice. She does that, right? That's Ariana. And then there's, uh, what's her name? Selena Go- Gomez or something like that. I wouldn't know her songs. I mean, maybe I would. My little boy knows. Every- it is so fun to watch this kid. He's about to turn 11 in December. This kid knows every song. I'm just saying he is because, you know, his mom listens to all that other stuff. I listen to talk radio. He learns nothing from me. But man, that little dude, the, the, something comes on the radio. He's a, he's singing and he actually can carry a tune and he's got moves, you know, not moves like Jagger, but he's got pretty good moves. I teach him. I've taught him some circa 60 dance moves. Yeah, because it'll come back. Yeah, it'll come back. And then when he's doing these circa 60 dance moves, the girls will be like, "Ooh, where'd that come from? My dad. <laughs> Woo. I was talking about Katy Perry, $9 for a ticket. But I know there's a lot to talk about. I was going to talk about this ESPN anchor, uh, Jamel. Is that her name? Jamel something? Racist? I have to cover that another time, but I will. Because y'all have asked me, Kevin, what about the ESPN anchor? Look, we talk about a lot of stuff here. I would love to be able to keep up with everything, but I can't. Maybe we'll get to Jamel. We'll see. Anyway, $9 for a ticket. New low. Katy Perry might have to consider adult entertainment or maybe a side hustle. You know, work in the streets. $9 for a ticket. Come on. That, she, you know what happens when these people travel for concerts? They lose money. Are you aware of this? That's how Tony Braxton went broke. Tony Braxton filed for bankruptcy twice. Twice. Good looking girl that can sing T- twice. Uh, the second time, people were like, She's, Okay, Tony, shame on you the first time. Now, what's up with this girl? I think she was dating some big rapper. I don't know. And then she got a reality TV show. Then she had to file bankruptcy. Come on now. She shouldn't be filing bankruptcy on that. Oh, desperate celebrities. I'm not surprised, though. Constant bashing of the president. And, and folks, this is what I'm, t- when I talk about signs, this is a sign, constant bashing of Trump, Katy Perry, uh, campaigning for Hillary Clinton. And suddenly, boom, she gets hit with it. The Trump Hollywood demise. Yep. It's killing her career. Vocal advocate for Hillary Clinton, loud mouth promoting idiotic leftist policies. She opened up to Entertainment Weekly about the inspiration for her new album and how the election, quote, changed her. It changed her. Here's what she said. Now that I look at it, I was so grateful for the experience of the election to be able to find my voice and be able to test my voice. There was a lot of noise about me taking a stand because I was a neutral girl for a while. I was okay when someone told me, oh, just shut up and sing. <laughs> that is just precious, isn't it? It was good advice. Shut up and sing. The Dixie Chicks had already set the state. The, the who? The Dixie, the Dixie Chicks. Come on. Y'all remember them, right? The Dixie Chicks. Those two girls that talk smack about George Bush or something. That was Bush. Bush didn't have sticky likers. He didn't have sticky followers. He had people that just got just got mad at the Dixie Chicks for being political. Trump has sticky followers, sticky supporters. You know what? I, I, I explained that people that like Trump, they like Trump. And when he's done in the election, when he's I mean, when he gets reelected and he's finished with his eight years and he retires and runs off into the places where billionaires run off to, we will still like him. Because he, we're going to like the job that he did. Donald Trump is going to go down in history as one of the greatest presidents ever. And I'm telling you that as a guy who was not thrilled with Donald Trump as our president. There you have it. You heard it from me. I also told you he was going to get elected. So for those of you who are going, Kevin, come on, man. And you're being naysayers out there. Kevin, come on. What are you talking about? I mean, I, I like him and everything. But Kevin, that's a little bit of hyperbole. It's no hyperbole. That's what's going to happen. Why do you think the left is so scared? Why do you look, folks? 
look at everybody that Donald Trump criticizes. Look at the people that he that that he says you're on the team, and look at the different. Look at their what happens to them when Donald Trump goes, "You're it," you shoot up. When Donald Trump goes, he tweets, "Up, oh, terrible person, terrible, awful, awful guy, whatever, awful person, awful company, whatever," in the tank. Look at it. Go. I told you guys. Give me if Donald Trump told me, Kevin, I'm going to be tweeting about Joe Blow company and I'm mad at him and I'm going to be tweeting about him. I would consider that inside stock information because <laughs> I'm going to go invest. I'm going to sell them short. What do they call it? You know, you have puts and calls. I'm going to do a put on it or a call, whichever one is negative. I'm going to do that on them. Make me some money. And if Donald Trump says he likes them, I'm not going to buy the stock. I'm going to do a put. I think that's what you call it, a put. When you say, I believe this stock is going to go up. So if Donald Trump goes, you know what? I'm going to start smoking me some whatever cigarette. Like if he said, I'm going to smoke some, you know, what's it? What is it? RJR Reynolds. I love RJR Reynolds. They're a great company. American tradition. You got to love them. Tobacco. It's an industry. Blah, blah, blah. I just said to you, now you know where my money went. Bada bing, bada boom. But yeah, you you post poke the tiger, and things get ugly. And that's what happened to uh, to uh, Katy Perry. MC, they said uh, this this type of demise has happened over the last two years, and it's mostly being you know it's happening to the leftist. They said when Katy Perry hosted the uh, uh, MTV, they call it the VMAs, Video Music Awards. Least watched in TV history. Then this year, the VMA, phew, nothing, nothing. This year's award show drew 5.4 million viewers, making it the lowest rated VMA since 1994 when Wilson, when Nielsen rather started measuring the show. Steady decline for the past several years. 6.5 million watched in 2.6 in 2016. 9.8 million watched a year before. Think about that. From 9.8 million in 2015 to 6.5 million in 2016, they lost 3.3 million viewers. The year before, in 2014, they were at 10.3 million. So they dropped a half a million the, the, the following year. Highest rated was 2002, 11.95 million. So just say 12 million. Roughly 12 million down to 6 million from 2002 to 2017. Are you people starting to get it that we don't need to pay attention to these fools? They say it was in, in, and for the record, if you didn't follow the VMAs this year, you want to know what it was? It was a giant anti-Trump fest of live of leftist who believe they matter and who believe that, you know, that's going to help their ratings. It torpedoed their ratings. And if you think it beat them up this year where they went down to 5.4 million viewers, so they've lost, they've gone from 12 million to 5.4 million in from 2002 to 2016, 2017. What do you think is going to happen next year? When do they finally go, you know what? The MTV Music Awards or VMA Awards don't even matter anymore. Glad to see it. Katie pulled out a handmaid's tail outfit during her opening monologue about how the world is on fire. Presenter Paris Jackson spoke about the need to resist and the song F Donald Trump was playing during commercial breaks. But the left doesn't get it. See, these Holly weirdos and leftists like them are so full of themselves and their rhetoric. They have all the liberal friends who think you know, the same, they act the same. Their diversity is skin deep. They ridicule anybody who dare think for themselves and regular folk, people like you and me, we're sick of them. We're sick of them. We're sick of how they treat the country. We're sick of how they treat the president and their resisting has fallen on deaf ears. The summer of resistance is such a joke. I, I laugh about it. Hollywood's going broke. Person by person, and company by company, and they don't get it. And it's not just Hollywood. It's Target suffering. It's the NFL. It's Starbucks. It's other companies. Meanwhile, Chick-fil-A, Hobby Lobby, all are going up. Boop, 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 boop. 
the glitz of Hollywood doesn't even blind you anymore because you can barely see it. And I'm glad to see these guys get hammered. I seriously am. I don't wish any bad luck on people, but sometimes you bring it on yourself. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wish it away from you. Because it's a simple thing to do. Shut up and sing. It's good advice. He won't stop until he's the top rated radio talk show host in America. What kind of weird competitive freak are you? This is the Kevin Jackson Radio Show.